Hi everybody, I'm Fuad Dakwad and welcome to my presentation, Archetypal Arabs, the nuances of Arab and Muslim representation in gaming. So to start off a little bit about myself, I'm Fuad or Fuad, I'm Palestinian, I'm a singer-songwriter and composer, I'm a junior at Swarthmore College and a graduate of NYU's Future Game Designers program. I'm also a two-time GDoc attendee, and I would have been three for three, but I was living on campus in Pennsylvania last summer and unfortunately couldn't make it. But all that to say, I am so excited to be recording this for you all today. Currently, I'm writing and recording an original rock opera called In Vitro, which tackles gene editing technology and how it'll intersect with race, particularly in the context of the Arab community, which has had such a close proximity to whiteness historically. So I'd love to get started on this talk by giving a rundown of Orientalism, which is a term first coined in 1978 by Palestinian intellectual and former Columbia professor of literature, Edward Said. In his book, he talks about the othering of Eastern life on behalf of the West and the particular exoticized and backwards nature attributed to the Arab world, and that this stems from colonialist mentalities, but also incentivizes further colonialism. So Orientalism has become key to uncovering the discrimination against Arabs, especially in a U.S. context. We also have to look at Real Bad Arabs, which is a study first performed and published by Dr. Jack Shaheen in 2001. He looked at 1,000 films from between 1896 to 2000 that feature Arabs and Muslims, and then he qualified whether they positively, neutrally, or negatively portrayed those characters. Out of those 1,000 films, 936 portrayed Arabs and Muslims negatively. Not to mention these were all pre-9-11, since which circumstances have unfortunately only gotten worse. His book was also adapted into a film in 2006, which you can see the poster for on the left there. So Shaheen identified four main stereotypes of Arabs and Muslims in film. The first was the evil, violent, terroristic, bad Arab. So this, I'm sure we can all think of dozens of examples. They're littered across our media. A good example in video games is Khaled al-Assad from Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare. He's on the top left of that photo collage there. He is by all accounts a bad Arab. He runs a terrorist organization, he uses violence, and he's the main villain of the first act of that game. Number two is the shallow or silly Arab character who pursues only fun, lust, and extravagance. This character is also usually very wealthy. An example of this in video games is Yusuf Amir from Grand Theft Auto 4. He's on the bottom there. And number three is the Bedouin Arab character removed from civilization and science. An example of this is Al-Tayyar ibn al-Ahad from the original Assassin's Creed. Of course, he's very directly removed from modern society and civilization because we're living through his memories. But he's a perfect example of the Bedouin Arab. And number four is the arrogant Arab character that is portrayed to be especially regressive of women. Uh, Yusuf Amir actually harasses women that happen to be sex workers in another scene of Grand Theft Auto. So sometimes one character summarizes multiple stereotypes. Like Orientalism, though, where there was a simultaneous exoticization and also backwardness attached to Arabs, there's a contradictory nature to these stereotypes. It says that Arabs can be both violent, rich, well-connected, and therefore powerful, but also pitiful, idiotic, and powerless. So the purpose of this talk is to analyze recent games that feature Arab and Muslim characters and their nuanced reaffirmations of both Orientalism, but also that general trend of Arab and Muslim representation, negative representation in American media that Jack Shaheen tackled in film. So to start out, the oldest game I'm going to be talking about, and maybe the most popular, is Counter-Strike Global Offensive, particularly the elite crew, who are the terrorist-sided characters on the map Dust2 and the map Mirage. If you know CSGO at all well, you know that Dust2 is by far the most popular map, so these characters are very often associated with the game. One could argue, though, that the game takes on a, a number of different locales, and, and therefore there are a number of different terrorists of other backgrounds. However, in my research, five out of the 17 terrorist factions considered throughout the series have been Middle Eastern. That's almost a third being associated with the terrorist and uh, counter-terrorist game mode. Not to mention that there was a study in 2013 by Munibas Salim and Craig Anderson, which actually utilized Counter-Strike. They 
had one group play a level, a round of Counter-Strike, in which the terrorist faction were Arabs. They had another group play another round of CSGO in which the terrorists were Russian, and they had a third group play a non-violent golfing game. They then tested the anti-Arab sentiments and thoughts on Arabs before and after having played those games. And what they found was the standard tests showed that playing violent video games, even those featuring Russians as terrorists, increased anti-Arab attitudes. So even when they're playing a game mode where Arabs aren't directly the terrorist portrayed, anti-Arab sentiments increased after the fact, which is likely due to the interchangeability of, of the term terrorist with Arab and Muslim in American society post 9-11. But I decided to look further into the Elite crew. So here is their official description in the Counter-Strike Condition Zero Strategy Guide. So if you look at their origin, somewhere in the Middle East, already right off the bat, very unspecific, but we know that they're from somewhere in the Middle East. Their focus is that they're a fundamentalist terrorist organization whose members believe that their evil plans will allow them to take over the world. I don't know how much more 2D you can get with your villain uh, aspirations, but it seems like world domination in the name of vague fundamentalism, fundamentalism, fundamentalism of some sort. They then go into much further detail, though, about their specific targets and their specific acts of, again, a fictional terrorist group. This includes the poisoning of a water supply on a Greek luxury cruise ship. They then say that their strength is several hundred members spread throughout the world with political support from Libya and Syria. So now we have that their origin is somewhere in the Middle East and that they get support uh, and training and logistic assistance and financial aid even from Libya and Syria. But if you look at the player model on the right over there, you'll see that they're wearing headscarves, all the characters are, and this is actually a particular Arab headscarf called a kufiya. And kufiyas are particularly colored based on where they're associated with in the Arab world. So, for example, the black and white kufiya that this character is wearing is specifically a Palestinian kufiya. So now we've got that their origin is somewhere in the Middle East, they're getting support from Libya and Syria, and yet they're wearing Palestinian attire. And as you likely know, most Palestinians are either living under brutal military occupation in the West Bank, a, a blockade in Gaza, or are living as refugees across the world. So I, I'm not 100% sure how they would get access to these listed European and Western aligned uh, countries that are being targeted. Not to mention that if they were taking actual, if they were looking at actual terror groups within the Middle East, which are most often uh, begun due to Western imperialism or American interventionalism, their victims are most often other Arabs and Middle Eastern people. Because, of course, if there's a group functioning within a certain territory, those living in that territory will be the most affected. But all of that nuance is nowhere to be found in this description. So I decided to search up where the maps in question in-game take place. It turns out both Dust2 and Mirage are set in Morocco. And if you have a minute, pull up a map of North Africa and the Middle East, because Morocco's in North Africa. And place a dot on Morocco, Palestine, Syria, and Libya. And then, of course, we've got the somewhere in the Middle East, which we don't know where that is. What you'll find is that that's a giant swath of land. This covers a lot, and it's clear that there was no mindfulness about the specifics of this group or their geography. And it results in a wishy-washiness of the Middle East as a whole. So again, I had a friend who told me, but wait, you can't be so hard on the Middle Eastern terrorist groups in this game because there are terrorist groups of all kinds in this game. There are white terrorist groups. So I decided to look at one of those, uh, the American terrorist group, the professionals in this game. This is their official description on the Counter-Strike wiki. The professionals are high-tech, well-equipped thieves with no political or religious agenda. So right off the bat, they're almost being complimented as high-tech, well-equipped, futuristic almost, and they're told to have no political or religious agenda whatsoever. Again, if you were to actually look at terror groups within the United States, you'd find that almost all of them certainly do have a political agenda tied to white supremacy and often a religious agenda tied to Christian fundamentalism, but that's nowhere to be found here. And finally, it says that they're backed by an unknown but well-financed organization. So unlike the elite crew, which is specifically funded by two Middle Eastern states, 
uh, this group is very vague in where they get their support. And then, of course, if you look at their player models, they're, as their name suggests, dressed very professionally, unlike the elite crew's more ragged nature. So now let's look at a more recent example. This is Rashid from Street Fighter V. He was the first Arab character to be introduced to the series, and his inclusion was considered a diversity victory. An IGN article called him uh, diverse and devastating. And he was almost considered to replace Ryu as the main character of the series, according to Takayuki Nakayama, who's the director of the series. Uh, however, he already has some issues. He immediately fits Dr. Shaheen's second category as a carefree, rich Saudi Arabian aristocrat. He, in his very nature, his dialogue, all of it perfectly fits Dr. Shaheen's stereotype. He also has a faithful servant named Azem who follows him around and calls him master. This is not only tone deaf to the harmful legacy of the Arab slave trade, especially against enslaved uh, African individuals, and also the current oppressive conditions of migrant workers in Arab Gulf countries. Another recent example is Ash from Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Siege, who is apparently half Palestinian, half Israeli. However, in her official biography, you can immediately find that her place of birth is listed as Jerusalem, Israel. This, already right off the bat, is a slap in the face to Palestinians. Jerusalem is not even considered by the international community to be Israeli territory. Of course, much of the region is contested, but Jerusalem especially, because of how many holy sites there are for all three major monotheistic faiths. And to say... Jerusalem, Israel, on the official Rainbow Six Siege website, is already incredibly harmful. Not only that, she also serves in the Israeli Defense Forces after college, the IDF. The IDF is a militant organization and, and very violent organization that upholds the military occupation of the West Bank and regularly brutalizes Palestinians, as well as Ethiopian Jews and other marginalized people within the region. She then joins the Shaldag, which is the Israeli Air Force Commando Unit responsible for a number of undercover operations and war crimes against Arab civilians. Uh, most notably, they went undercover during the First Intifada, which was primarily, almost entirely peaceful, uh, mass mobilization of Palestinians, which was quashed by the Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, who uh, instituted a break their bones policy which literally directed IDF soldiers to break the bones of Palestinians in order to stop them from involving themselves in this mass mobilization effort. Her official quote on the website is that you can never truly understand a conflict until you've been on both sides. However, it's very clear from what I just listed that she's only been on one side of this supposed conflict, and yet she claims to be on both. In fact, I had a relative who is half Jewish, Israeli, and half Palestinian, and he too decided to join the IDF at one point in his life. His quote about it, though, is very distinct from Ash's. Juliano Merchamis says, I wanted to be on one side. I wanted to be with somebody because I felt like nobody. And Juliano writes more about his time in the IDF, and he wrote about how he was forced to brutalize Palestinians, how his job was to carry around a bag filled with knives to place alongside the bodies of murdered Palestinians in order to give reasoning for their unjust killings. Giuliano ultimately became a theater artist who worked with Palestinian children to work for their liberation through art. So he eventually came to terms with, with his identity as both Palestinian and Israeli and worked towards humanity for all. Ash doesn't seem to have any sort of introspection when it comes to her complicity in both the IDF in, and the Shaldag, and then eventually the FBI. Next, we have the most recent title on this list, and we've got Cypher from Valorant, who I didn't even know was Middle Eastern North African until very recently. He's defined as the Moroccan surveillant on the official Valorant wiki. And if you don't immediately see some red flags about the fact that the one Arab character uses a move set comprised of surveillance and security camera spying equipment given the fact that there is documented evidence that the US surveyed Arab and Muslim communities disproportionately post 9-11 and have been the target of those methods there's, there's a clear disconnect there not only that though 
He's also the only faceless character in the roster besides Omen, who is a literal demon. And his attire and the reason he doesn't show any skin is never really explained, and it further dehumanizes him, and he's already a cyborg. <laughs> so it's dehumanization on top of dehumanization for the only Arab character on the roster. Finally, I'm going to talk about Overwatch, which has gotten a lot of praise for its diversity efforts the past few years. Specifically, Farah or Farah. And the story goes that in development, she was referred to as the Rocket Queen and had the same gameplay as she does now, uh, to quote her, reigning justice from above. And later, she was assigned the identity as an Egyptian woman. There was specific controversy later on regarding a skin that was assigned to her, which had First Nations uh, identity uh, and was inspired by attire from First Nations people. And yet they later they they went silent for several months until later retroactively assigning her first nations identity on her father's side before that point it felt like a complete brownwashing and saying it doesn't matter if she's arab she can wear indigenous traditional clothing that is not the case and should not be the case and frankly they probably gave her her identity to cover up for that fact um, and then there's also, of course, and I know I'll get some pushback on this, but the fact that they assigned the, the rocket missile launching character to be Arab, given the, the fact that most Arabs nowadays are forced to answer for groups like Hezbollah and Hamas for firing missiles and rockets. But, but I'll, I'll, I'll cut them some slack there. Then they announced the first DLC character, who happened to be Anna, Farah's mother and therefore our second Arab character in the game. Anna differs greatly from her daughter, not only in personality, but also in gameplay. She's more of a healer rather than a more bombastic, offensive type character. However, there is something to say about the fact that Anna is not an Arabic name. It's a very, very westernized name, so there is something about the, off about the fact that the healer and the more caring individual between the two got a more western-coded name. But again, I gotta give credit where credit's due, and Overwatch's successes are that they feature multiple Arab characters, which helps reaffirm that our community is not monolithic by any means, and it also depicts a map that uh, in the Middle East, which is futuristic and utopic, which is a far cry from maps in Call of Duty and CSGO, which have vaguely Middle Eastern war-torn countries. So, okay, I've talked a lot about my problems with recent games. What is the solution? Because I don't want to dissuade anyone from including an Arab or Muslim character in their game, but we need to make sure that we're doing it properly. I'm sure a lot of these solutions could have been fixed by someone who has the same lived experience that I have, or who had done the research on Orientalism and some of Jack Shaheen's findings. So that's step one, is learning. It's studying these topics and other legacies of harmful representation before you represent people. Number two, though, requires diversifying not only your game's characters and roster, but your studio or team's high-ranking positions. The people making decisions about the game should be reflective of the society that you're releasing your game to. That's not only for games in which you have more diverse characters or where you're aiming to have such a roster, it should go for all the time because you will have a more successful process if you have a better set of voices and a more realistic set of voices on the team. Number three, I hope we're all at already, and that's recognizing the power of games. There is an unmatched empathetic potential to the inherently interactive format of gaming. You literally step into someone else's shoes when you play a game, and that is something that most of us never get to do otherwise, of course. These, we have to look at games and no matter what their topic or what they're covering, they are opportunities for justice and humanization. And if we look at it as such, we will recognize that with great power comes great responsibility. And if we don't do these steps, especially steps one and two, we're most likely going to be rehashing the same 936 out of a thousand films that Jack Shaheen studied. Because the fact is, we are all growing up in a society in which that's already the case. And that leads us to step four. We have to ditch liberal, colorblind ideology and the idea that we don't see race. Because diversity in-game is not good enough. 
you can't retroactively assign your characters to specific races because then you could end up in Overwatch's situation or Valorant's situation in which you haven't been intentional about making sure these characters are representative of actual Arabs or any other marginalized group. And they must not further feed discriminatory beliefs. And how do we do this? We adopt explicitly anti-racist frameworks instead. You take what you've learned in step one, all of the, the research that you do, you work alongside the people on your team that have these lived experiences, and together, recognizing that power that games hold, we have to consider race during development so that we are part of the solution, al-hal, rather than the problem. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, you can find me at fuaddakwar.com or you can email me at fuaddakwarmusic at gmail.com.